everyone, I want to welcome you to the Power Hour. This is week number three of Live From Victory. If your mental GPS has been tracking with me for the last two weeks, you've realized that blood has been on my tongue quite a bit. I talked about a woman who is drunk with blood, the blood of the saints of Jesus. And she's drunk with their blood because she persecuted them and they give up their lives rather than giving up faith in Jesus. And I hope you understand that the blood of the lamb is what gives us victory. But in order for us to make use of the blood of the lamb, that is why I took us to John chapter 6 last week to help us to see that when we see Jesus and we believe in Jesus, then we drink his blood and his life becomes our life and he makes us just like him. Uh, we took a detour by going to John chapter 6. Today, I want to bring us to Jalan Raya called Revelation chapter 18, because this series is built on Revelation. In Revelation 18, uh, we see a situation in which victory is being proclaimed. Uh, I want to let you know that victory has been issued. You may have a problem today. You may have a a situation today. You may have an obstacle today. You may have a mountain in front of you today, but I want you to understand that God has a way for you to get over your problem. God has a way for you to get over your situation. And if you will track with me today, you're going to understand and realize exactly how that looks like. And I hope that the word I'm about to read to you right now will be a blessing to you. Revelation chapter 18, and we're looking at verse number one, all the way to verse number 18. I'm reading this morning from the English Standard Version of the Bible. The text says, After this I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was made bright with his glory. And he called out with a mighty voice, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place for demons, a haunt for every unclean spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable beast. For all nations have drunk the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality, and the kings of the earth have committed immorality with her. And the merchants of the earth have grown rich from the power of her luxurious living. Then I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people. Lest you take part in her sins, lest you share in her plagues, for her sins are heaped high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Pay her back as she herself has paid back others, and repay her double for her deeds. Mix a double portion for her in the cup she mixed. As she glorified herself and lived in luxury, so give her a like measure of torment and mourning. Since in her heart she says, I sit as queen, I am no widow, and mourning I shall never see. For this reason, her plagues will come in a single day, death and mourning and famine, and she'll be burned with fire. For mighty is the Lord who has judged her. Babylon has fallen. That's what I want to talk about today. Let us pray. Father God, one more time I pray for a fresh indwelling of the Spirit that you may lift me up. And Lord, that my words would be with power and I may speak in the Spirit and not in the flesh. This I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. On January 1st, 1863, Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation. This important document gave freedom to black people. Like the Israelites, black people could now leave their Egypt and head on to their promised land, the promised land of their dreams the promised land of self-determination, the promised land of building a family and building homes and owning property and becoming actors and 
becoming political leaders and, and pastors and, and doing great things for themselves. Because some states were far from Washington, D.C., because they did not have a technology like we have today, they did not have IG or Facebook or Twitter or FaceTime or email or text messaging or, or fax. They didn't have cable news networks like CNN and BBC. Messages often took months to reach certain places. Often people had to go on horseback to ride from state to state, from city to city, and declaring the message that was supposed to go to the whole, to the whole nation. So while President Lincoln signed the Emancipation, Emancipation Proclamation on the 1st of January, 1863, the message did not get to Texas until June 19, 1865. That is two and a half years later. That is 30 months later. That is many, many, many hours and days later. Uh, do you know that it is possible to be ignorant of victory, even though victory has been issued on your behalf? Do you know that it is possible to be ignorant of triumph, even though triumph has been issued on your behalf? Do you know that it is possible to be ignorant of the clearing of the mountain, even though the mountain has been cleared? I came to let somebody know today that your Emancipation Proclamation has been signed not by President Lincoln, but by King Jesus. I came to let somebody know today that your problem has a solution already, that your struggle has a solution already, that your heartache and that your anxiety has a problem already. I came to let every man, woman, boy, and girl to know today that God has issued your emancipa emancipation proclamation. We have an angel in our text today. This angel is not an ordinary angel. He's not an earthly angel. He's an angel from heaven. He's an angel from heaven because in order to deal with an earthly problem, you need a solution that is heavenly. He has come to declare a message of power and conviction. He has come with great authority because God has put his stamp of approval on him. He is a divine authorized. He is a divine certified. He is a divine trained messenger who has come to declare an important message. He's also come with brightness. He's also come with a message that is filling the entirety of the earth because the message is so important. And this is the message that he declares. And let me try to replicate, replicate how he did it. Fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great. She has become a dwelling place for demons, a haunt for every unclean spirit. A haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable beast. It's not the first time in scripture that this announcement of the fall of Babylon is declared. Isaiah made the same announcement. He said, and behold, here comes riders, horsemen in pairs. And he answered, fallen, fallen is Babylon. And all the carved images of our gods, he has shattered to the ground. Jeremiah followed the footsteps of Isaiah when he said, Suddenly, Babylon has fallen and been broken. Wail for her. Take balm for her pain. Perhaps she may be healed. Uh, the reason why I'm letting you know about all of these verses and letting you know about the declaration of this angel is to come to this foundational concept. God doesn't hide victory so only those who read the fine print will see it. God doesn't hide victory so that only those who are in upper management will see it. God doesn't hide victory so that only those who are influential will see it. 
God doesn't have victory so that only those who are spiritual or some Bible study guru will see it. God declares victory for all. God declares victory for the prostitute. God declares victory for the uh, persecuted. God declares victory for the one who is in pain. God declares for the one who is seeking prosperity. God declares victory for the addict. God declares victory for the diseased. God declares victory for the one who has been divorced and the one who will be divorced. God declares victory for the one who is struggling in a court case. God declares victory for somebody who doesn't know the Bible. God declares victory for somebody who is not a pastor. God declares victory for a child who has been abused by a parent. God declares victory for a child who doesn't feel like he's appreciated or loved. God declares victory for a parent who doesn't see appreciation from his children. God declares victory for anybody who has a struggle and a challenge. God doesn't have victory. God doesn't have victory for the few or the elect or the special. Victories for everybody. For God loved the whole world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. I'm here to let you know that victory has been issued for you. An emancipation proclamation has been issued for you. Triumph has been issued for you. The obstacle has been cleared. The mountain has been leveled. The valley has been filled. The flood has been stopped and put in a dam. Today, there is victory for you. The other day, I went to Circle K to buy one of my favorite drink. My zone, red cherry blossom. Ooh, I love, I love my zone. Cherry Blossom. I love it more than Pokari Sweat. For some reason, my zone just finds a way to minister to my, to my thirst. It finds a way to uh, bring back electrolytes in my system. Uh, my zone finds a way to, to, to really make me feel good. I don't know if somebody can relate to what I'm talking about right now. So I go to Circle K and I pick up three. <laughs> I, yeah, I picked up three <laughs> my zones. <laughs> I wanted a trinity, you know what I'm saying? And when I brought it to the counter, the cashier said to me, sir, wait a minute. I need to go consult with my boss. She came back. She said, sir, because you have bought three, you get one extra. You see, this cashier wanted to let me know of the advantage that I have because I purchased three. I want you to know that God wants you to understand that he has given an advantage for you. He has given you something free. You don't have to pay for it. Jesus already paid for it. All you have to do is to appreciate it and to accept it. He has made whatever is standing in your life. He has made it fall. He has given you victory. He has declared it fallen, fallen, fallen. Fallen, fallen is your adultery this morning. Hallelujah, somebody. Fallen, fallen is your conflicts this morning. Hallelujah, somebody. Fallen, fallen is your porn addiction this morning. Hallelujah, somebody. Fallen, fallen is your irresponsibility this morning. Hallelujah, somebody. Fallen, fallen is your self-hate this morning. Hallelujah, somebody. Fallen, fallen is your people pleasing this morning. Hallelujah, somebody. Fallen, fallen is your fear or speaking your mind this morning. Hallelujah, somebody. Fallen, fallen is your procrastination. And like the angel, I came to let you know today that your Babylon has fallen. Victory is yours this morning. It doesn't matter what you look like. It doesn't matter what you talk like. It doesn't matter what you wear. It doesn't matter what your bank account looks like. It doesn't matter how you feel right now. It doesn't matter if people don't like you right now. It doesn't matter if you've been stressed right now. It doesn't matter if it's difficult right now. Now, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Victory is yours. Jesus in his blood has made it fallen. And I came to let somebody know that this morning. But we need to ask ourselves a question. Babylon, what is this? Uh, Babylon, what is that? Uh, you see, when the biblical movie starts to unfold, uh, we get uh, an image of Babylon. Uh, these people that have been, have seen that God has destroyed the world by a worldwide flood. Uh, they say, you know what? We want to live how we want to live. 
We want to manage our lives the way we want to manage them. We want to sleep around. We want to drink around. Uh, we want to kill people the way we want to kill them. We don't want anybody to tell us what to do. So we don't want God to send another flood and we die. So what we're going to do is we're going to build up a walk around. We're going to build a tower all the way to heaven so that when the floods come again, they're not going to touch us. We are going to outsmart God. And that's how some of us are. We try to outsmart God. We try to work around God. We've been convicted by God, but yet we try to find a way to convert our conviction and change the message that God has delivered to us this morning. And so when you're introduced to Babylon at first sight, the Tower of Babel, you see that uh, Babylon is an idea, is an ideology is a way of being that is in opposition to God, that brings about a confusion about God. It puts God in position number two, number three. It wants God to be removed out of the picture. That is what Babylon begins to show us when we look at the biblical movie. When the biblical movie unfolds a little bit more, we come to Babylon and we begin to understand Babylon a little bit, bit, bit deeper because it's not just people trying to build a tower to escape a flood. Babylon becomes so influential that it becomes a worldwide empire. And King Neb, looking at how he had developed, how he had gone on a rampage and a sacrilege and killing everybody in his age, showing that he is powerful and he is mighty, standing at his balcony, looking over the great city that he has built. This is what he stands up and he says, is not this great Babylon? which I have built by my might, by my mighty power as a royal residence for the glory of my majesty. So from the biblical movie, Babylon represents intentional opposition of God by focusing on human capability. Babylon says, I can do all this by myself. Babylon says, who is God and why should I obey him? Babylon thinks of God as a non-factor in life or affairs. Babylon then is not just an ancient city, but it's an attitude. It's a mindset. It's a way of looking at life apart from God's authority. And I call this attitude confusion. And if you must know, Babylon does mean confusion. And some of us today are in confusion. Some of us today are in intentional opposition to God. Some of us today are trying to remove God out of the picture. And I believe that Babylon is well and alive today. Yes, it is alive. Some people are confused whether God is number one, number two, or number three. Some people prioritize their careers more than God, Babylon. Some people prioritize their families more than God. Babylon. Some people prioritize a relationship more than God, Babylon. Some people prioritize money more than God, Babylon. Some people, all they think about is hedonism and pleasure, Babylon. Some people, all they think about is how they're going to eat, where, where they're going to eat the next meal, where they're going to go for the next restaurant, where, how they're going, how they're going to catch the next movie. Some people, all they do is to live for pleasure. That is Babylon. Think about your own life today. Do you have a Babylonian attitude? Ask yourself, who is in charge of your money? Ask yourself, who determines what you do with your body and who you do it with? Who determines what goes in your body nutritionally? Who determines what goes in your body mentally? Who determines what goes into your body physically or sexually? You see, if you're in opposition or you are in a, in a place of rebellion, I want you to understand that, that is a representation of Babylon. Now, you see, as a biblical movie rolls on, uh, Babylon becomes something different. Babylon becomes a scary monster uh, like the dweller in the darkness in Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings. Babylon becomes... Uh, this, this hawkish creature becomes more powerful, more strong, more, more gnarly, uh, more evil, more bad, more vicious. And I want you to see Babylon in Revelation taking on a different nature. 
I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous names and he has seven heads and ten horns. And on her forehead was written a name of mystery. Babylon the great, the mother of prostitutes and of earth's abominations. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. In Revelation, Babylon is not just an ancient city like ancient Babylon. Babylon is not just an empire. Babylon is not just people trying to build a city to avoid a flood from God. Uh, Babylon takes on spiritual influence. And we are all looking for a spiritual influence in our lives. When we are looking for spiritual influence, where do we go to? We, we, we go to the word of God. Uh, we go to prayer. We, we call upon spiritual people. You understand what I'm saying? Uh, you, you see, to have a spiritual influence is a higher form of influence. Uh, many of you, when it's time to uh, dedicate your kids, what do you do? You go to a pastor. When it's time to uh, take your business to the next level, what do you do? You call for somebody to pray for you. It's, it's, it's spiritual influence is up there. And in Revelation, Babylon is not an ancient city. Babylon is not Nebuchadnezzar. Babylon is a spiritual influence. Somebody who is able to affect minds, somebody who is able to dictate doctrine, somebody who is able to direct practical matters of life, somebody who is able to dictate how people marry, someone who is able to dictate the beliefs that people hold on to. He has a spiritual influence. She has a spiritual influence. And you know this because of the way she's acting and behaving. She's able to kill the martyrs of Jesus. She is, she is drunk with the blood of the saints of Jesus and the martyrs of Jesus. These are the people who have not accepted her beliefs. And anytime Jesus is involved, he's in a situation, you know, that is spiritual. So she is able to have this power and this energy and this strength. She's able to have a spiritual influence. But you also see her spiritual influence on a worldwide scale. Watch this. For all nations have drunk the wine of the passion of our sexual morality, and the kings of earth have committed immorality with her, and the merchants of earth have grown rich from the power of her luxurious living. You see, sexual immorality is any unlawful sexual intercourse, any unlawful sexual behavior, any unlawful unlawful sexual behavior, anything that is not natural to the human body, anything that doesn't fit, that is sexual immorality. But here is not the focus. This is not the focus when the text uses sexual morality. The focus is something different. Uh, the focus is talking about somebody who was once faithful to a partner, somebody who had declared their vows and they said, for better or for worse, in sickness and in health, I will be with you. But this person, instead of holding on to that word, instead of keeping that promise, has broken it and has become an unfaithful. And notice what Babylon has done, Babylon the Great has done, is that she has committed sexual morality with the kings of the earth. These are the political leaders. These are people who shape policy, uh, people who determine laws, people who determine PPKMs, uh, people who require double dosages, people who determine whether you get on a plane or not. These are the people who have authority, who have power. She has made them commit sexual immorality. She has made them unfaithful. She has also influenced merchants. She says the merchants of the earth have grown rich from the power of her luxurious living. She, 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 has, she has brought them in her fold and influenced them so that she leads them. And this is a higher form of power. She's no longer a political power. She's no longer an economic power. She sits above the political power and she sits above economic power. So she is loaded. 
She is powerful. She's authoritative and she is strong. She has been able to make them drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. A debate exists in the text. Is Should it say uh, the wine of the wrath or the wine of the passion of a sexual morality? Should it say that? I don't know which side we need to look at here this morning. Uh, but we need to just focus on this point. That she has been able to make them commit sexual and immorality. In the Bible, when we speak about sexual morality, uh, we are speaking about spiritual unfaithfulness. She's been so influential that she has made them unfaithful to God. She has made them turn their backs on God. And this is what the situation is this morning. Instead of her influencing people for Jesus, she's influencing them for herself. So hear me carefully now. You see, Babylon is an idea. It is a habit or belief which makes us unfaithful to God. Unfortunately, too many Babylonian ideas, too many Babylonian habits, too many Babylonian beliefs are in play today in which people are unfaithful to God. People running around unfaithful to God. Unfortunately, there is Babylonian ideas regarding the day of worship. Uh, some people insist that the Sabbath is Sunday. Uh, some people still argue and debate, is it Sunday or is it Sabbath? Some people are still looking around for evidence. They haven't bought in, into it yet. Uh, some, some believe uh, that it is true, but... They are unwilling to leave their church family because that is all they have ever known. And they are stuck in Babylon over the Sabbath. Uh, to be fair, uh, some people do worship on Sunday. Some people honor Sunday because they don't know about Sabbath. But that still keeps them in a state of unfaithfulness to God. And some of us do know about Sabbath. We believe in it. We can argue it. We can talk somebody into it. Uh, but yet Sabbath is not a holy day. It is a holy day. <laughs> uh, some of us treat Sabbath uh, as any other day. Uh, we Instead of us making the Sabbath a day to do sacred work, instead of us bringing people uh, the blessing of the gospel, instead of us going to visit someone who is homeless or someone who is poor, uh, we spend the Sabbath Focusing on ourselves, doing activities that will bring pleasure to ourselves. Instead of us allowing other people to experience the grace of the Sabbath. Instead of us letting people rest on Sabbath. Instead of us giving people the, 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 the idea that the Sabbath celebrates freedom from sin. We are keeping people in chains by making them work for us and, and, and us wanting them to do a bit extra for us. Uh, that is Babylon going on. But I came to announce to you today that the Babylon of the Sabbath has fallen. Because Jesus Christ uh, would not resurrect on the Sabbath. He waited until it was Sunday to get up from the grave because he wanted us to let us know that the Sabbath is legit. That the Sabbath is true. And that anybody who is a believer in him will want to follow his will, his purpose, and his plan, and will do whatever makes him happy. The Babylon of Sabbath has fallen. And I want you to understand that if you're in a place of Babylon, not understanding whether it's Sabbath or Sunday, today I came to let you know that it has fallen. It has fallen. There is Babylon going on about uh, what happens when uh, you die? It's a nice idea to believe that when you die, you come out of, uh, you, you, you die, you go straight to heaven and you connect with God. It's nice to know that. Uh, but again, uh, the Bible says when somebody dies, they go into the grave. And when they go into their graves, their thoughts perish. Their dreams perish. They are no longer an existing entity. They 
are gone. And Jesus also shows us that the, the Babylon of what happens when you die has fallen because when he died, he did not go straight to heaven. When he died, he stayed in the grave until he became a resurrectee and was resurrected. That is the only time that he was able to go back to heaven. And so Jesus lets us know today that the Babylon of Death has also fallen. Today, you don't need to wonder what happens when somebody dies. What you need to know is that when you put a person in the ground, they go into the ground until the day when the, 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 the trumpet of the archangel shall sound and all of us who are in, and those who are in their graves will rise up and meet Jesus and be with him forever. I came to let you know today that the Babylon of this state of the dead and what happens to people when they die, I want to let you know that it has fallen. And let's be faithful to God and believe his word and live according to what it teaches. There's also Babylonian ideas about love going on today. Uh, some people don't understand uh, that Jesus <laughs> was faithful to one. Jesus, instead of divorcing the church, decided to give his life as a sacrifice for the church. Jesus, instead of leaving her behind, he decided to shape her into the image that he had. He decided to teach her about himself. He decided to send prophets and apostles to instruct the church on what uh, he, she should be like. Instead of Jesus enjoying benefits Without commitment, he decided to climb on the cross and on the cross, he died for his faithful and beautiful bride. And on the cross, he said, you know what? I love you and I'm willing to put up with you for the rest of my life. And I'm not going to leave you behind, but I'm not going to enjoy the benefits yet because I have a place to prepare for you. So I'm going to go to heaven, prepare a place for you. I'm not going to live in, live in with you now. I'm not going to enjoy you now. Now, I'm going to make sure that the place is prepared and then I'm going to come and take you. We're going to have our ceremony and then we are going to be together in heaven. You and I are not going to have different beliefs. You and I are not going to see the world differently. We're going to believe in the same God. We're going to believe in the same mission. You are not going to be Catholic and I'm not going to be Adventist. We are going to be Adventist. We're going to have the same faith. We're going to have the same understanding. And somebody needs to understand. We need to to look at Jesus to give us a clear picture of what it means to love, of what it means to commit, of what it means to be married, of what it means to push through because some of us have Babylonian ideas about love and I came to let you know today that Jesus is also saying the Babylon of wrong ideas about love has fallen because he is a prime example of what it means to love, of what it means to be committed, or what it means to honor, of what it means to sacrifice. And I will talk about some more other Babylonian ideas. We see Babylonian ideas about the Bible. When people come together to study the Bible, it's about what do you think? How does it sound to you? And there's nothing wrong with that kind of question. But the Bible was given in a specific context, in a specific situation. You and I will need to learn the context. We need to understand wh what people thought in those times. We need to understand what people wore in those times. We need to understand how economics happened in those times. We need to understand how marriages were done in those times. So that when we're reading the Bible, we're coming from a place of clarity, not a place of confusion, Babylon. And too many of us are in that state going around in the word of God, going around in the Bible, confused more and more and more. But Jesus also uh, declares today that the Babylon of misunderstanding of the scriptures has fallen as well because he says I, these scriptures, they testify about me. They talk about me. I have come in the volume of the book. I am the word in the beginning. I am the word that was with God. I am God. And these Babylonian ideas about what we think about tithe. Some of us are confused about this. Should it go to the church? Should it go to some, uh, to, to some charity foundation? Whatever it is. But Jesus also declares in his word. He says, bring all the tithe to the storehouse and I will bless you. And I'll open the windows of heaven. Brother and sister, it's clear in the word of God. We need to understand what he is wanting 
out of us. There is Babylon about the end of the world. There is Babylon about those who choose to sing praises to God, yet they'll fill their lungs with cigarettes and weed and vape. Some of us have Babylon going on about choosing, <laughs> like this woman, to drink wine, to drink alcohol, and to get others drunk. But I came to declare to you today that Babylon has fallen. Babylon has fallen. You see, God wants us to live committed lives to him today. He wants us to be true to him today. He wants us to be faithful. And if there is anything in your life that is making you unfaithful to God, understand that that is Babylon. And Jesus is saying to you today, Babylon has fallen. Babylon has fallen because he wants you and I to find victory. I want to show you three principles of how you and I can find victory from Babylon. The first thing is victory begins when you recognize Babylon has fallen. It's very clear from the very beginning. Uh, Babylon has fallen, has fallen, has fallen. Uh, the message is very clear. And so you and I need to recognize that Babylon has fallen. The Bible is saying God has confronted the struggle. Somebody says to conquer something, you need to confront it. And I'm glad this morning that we don't have to confront Babylon. Babylon has already been confronted by God. It has already fallen. And it's so true. If you want to quit smoking, you have to confront the fact that you're a smoker. If you want to quit uh, to, to, to drink more water, you need to confront the fact that you don't drink enough water. So the point of, 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 of victory begins by confrontation. But you and I don't need to confront our Babylons. We simply need to recognize it. And Jesus was able to confront and defeat Babylon on the cross. Let me prove it to you for a second. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things that through death he might destroy the one who has power of death. That is the devil. There you have it. Jesus lived your experience. Jesus lived my experience so that he can let you know that whatever, whatever you're going through, whatever your struggle is, he's already defeated it. You don't have to worry about it. He has won. And all you need to do is to simply recognize it and take it by faith. Take it by faith. Believe it by faith. And when I tell you, recognize it, I'm saying, look at it by the eyes of faith. Whatever your Babylon is. In fact, let me quote the words of one of my favorite writers. She talks about recognizing something by faith. Watch this. When the enemy comes with his darkness, sing faith. And talk faith. And you will find that you have sung and talked yourself into light. Did you get that? You will find that you have sung and talked yourself into light when you sing faith and when you take faith. Uh, listen to me. Uh, let me make this practical and bring it down to your level. Whatever your Babylon is, you need to speak at it as if it's already been accomplished and defeated. You need to be able to say, Babylon or Sabbath, you're already defeated. You need to be able to say, Babylon of the state of the dead, you're already defeated. Babylon of wrong ideas about love, you're already defeated. Babylon of wrong ideas about the Bible and tithe and ideas about the end of the world, you're already defeated. Because my faith helps me to see beyond you. I am not seeing at you. I am seeing at what God can able to do for me. Brother and sister, we need to be able to talk faith into our existence. We need to be able to talk about it because whatever we say, whatever we declare becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy.
If you keep telling yourself I'm stupid, if you keep telling yourself I'll never be loved, if you keep telling yourself that I'm no good for nothing, if you keep telling yourself that my organization can never reach that standard, if you keep telling yourself that I will never amount to anything, guess what? You are going to be what you're declaring over yourself. But you need to be able to flip the script and change the diction and the, the, the words that you let out come out of, your, out of your mouth. You need to be able to say, though I am weak, yet I am strong. Strong. You need to be able to say, though he may slay me, <laughs> though he may kill me, yet I will trust in him. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. So when you're facing that problem, <laughs> whatever it is, you need to be able to say to the problem, you have been defeated. I have already overcome. I need you to understand something this morning. As a Christian, you need to be able to live in the already and not yet. You see, in the text, when the text says, fallen, fallen is Babylon, this text is given to us in the aorist tense. You see, in the English language, you don't have the aorist tense. We have present, we have future and past. That, that, those are the tenses in English. But in the Greek language, they had an aorist tense. The aorist tense allow you to see an event in a, sap, in, in a snapshot fashion. It helped you to see the event in, 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 in grand scheme. So now when the text says, fallen, fallen is Babylon, it is using the Aries tense. It is giving a snapshot of the fall of Babylon. Boom, Babylon has fallen. But it is not exactly saying that Babylon has fallen. Uh, it is not exactly saying that the execution of the fall of Babylon has happened. It is still something that is yet to come. But you see, God, when he speaks over something, though it is not executed, it is executed the moment it has come out of his word. Are you talking about, I understand what I'm saying? And so you and I need to learn to live in the already, but not yet. You may not have it yet, but when you have faith in God, you already have it. <laughs> you may not have the marriage yet, but when you believe in God, you already have it. You may not have the release from your debt yet, but when you believe in God, you already have it. You may not have the health yet, but when you believe in God, you already have it. I don't know if I'm speaking to you this morning. You may not have the answer to the prayer yet, but when you believe in God, you already have it. You may not have the love of your loved ones and they may be down in the grave, but when you believe in God, you already have them alive because God speaks in the present, in the future, in the past, at the same time. God doesn't know the past. God doesn't know the future. God doesn't know the present. He knows time at every season and at every moment. And when he has promised you things, you need to believe in them. When he has given you things, you need to take them as a reality, though they're not executed yet. You need to learn to live in the already and not yet. And so you and I, when we're looking at our Babylons, when we're looking at our situations and our struggles. We need to believe that in Jesus, they're already defeated. And that is how you and I can learn to live from victory. He said the second thing in order for you to appreciate victory is that you need to understand victory initiates when you get out from Babylon. Notice in verse four and five, then I heard another voice from heaven say, Come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her sins, lest you share in her plagues, for her sins are heaped high as heaven. God has remembered her iniquities. See, Babylon ain't a place to stay. You got to come out. When you have discovered that something is Babylon in your life, when a habit is Babylon in your life, when a belief is Babylon in your life, when an idea is Babylon in your life, when people are Babylon in your life, when a workplace is Babylon in your life, when a church is Babylon in your life, you got to come out. And here's where many of us struggle. Because Babylon is all that we know. Babylon is all that we're used to. It's very uncomfortable for us to go back to something else that we do not know. The other day I was running and my coach told me, Henry, your form in running is not good. Now I was confused by that, but my coach is telling me 
my running form is Babylon. Because he's saying, Henry, when you run, you're doing like this. And when you're doing like this, you're wasting energy. And I'm thinking that I'm running and I'm good. He says, no, Henry, you are wasting energy. You are beating yourself up. But what you need to do is to make sure that when you're swinging your arms, you're swinging your arms, you're not wasting energy. And so I was enlightened. And so at that moment, when we did our first set, I made it a point to come out of Babylon. And there I was running in correct form, you know, making sure that I'm swinging my arms. And my coach could tell me, pass, Henry, man, man, tap, man, tap, man, tap. But you know what? At some point, I realized that running in the correct form, though it was the best form, it was difficult for me. And so you know what I did? I went back to my Babylonian form and I started to do like this before. Why? Because I was comfortable in this. I wasn't comfortable in that. And some of us are comfortable in this. We're not comfortable in that. And that is why it is hard to get out of Babylon. It is hard to leave certain people. It is hard to leave certain ideas. It is hard to leave certain habits because it's what we know. It's what we are used to. But let me let you know, Babylon is a place of death. The text says, come out of her, my people, lest you take part <laughs> in her sins. When God is calling you out, he doesn't call you out and say, come out, you addict. Come out, you you adulterer. Come out, you fornicator. Come out, you liar. Come out, you procrastinator. Come out, you who doesn't know how to speak his or her mind. Come out, you who is so messed up. No, God says, come out of her, my people. God says, I see you as mine. And that is why I want you to get out of it. And that's what I want someone here to understand. God is not calling out of Babylon because he hates you. God is not calling out of Babylon because he wants to put you in a bad spot. God is calling out of Babylon because he loves you. He cares for you. And he's saying, to you, come out of her, my people. Come out of it, my people. Leave it, lest you share in its destruction. Because Babylon has fallen. It's not yet executed, <laughs> but it's a reality. Because as a believer, you live in the already, though it is not yet. So come out. Come out of it. Today is time to come out. It's time, out, it's time to come out of the toxicity in your life. It's time to come out of toxic people, toxic jobs, toxic groups, toxic habits. Come out. It's time to come out of Babylonian ideas. Come out. Come out. Thirdly, it's important you don't cry over Babylon. You see, I wish I could tell you that Babylon was all salt and sugar, but it's not the truth. Because Babylon is actually sweet. It's actually nice. There's a lot of sugar there. And we have two groups within this text that find sugar in Babylon. And when they see that Babylon has fallen, they cry. The first group are kings. These are the, the powerful. These are the people who shape policy. These are the people that find power in, in, in Babylon. And they weep over Babylon. They, 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 the text says in verse 10, They will, the kings of the earth, they will stand far off in fear of her torment and say, Alas, alas, you great city, you mighty city, Babylon. For in a single hour, your judgment has come. They're feeling terribly sorry for her. They're crying over her because they found power in Babylon. Do you know that you can find power in Babylon? Do you know that you can find sugar in Babylon? And that is why it is hard to come out. That is why it is difficult to come out. And some of us are crying over Babylon. Uh, we know it was a bad relationship and we did come out of it, but we are crying over the benefits we had. Uh, he had a car or she took me places or uh, it was nice. I know there were hard days or straight but man, it was nice. And some of us are crying over Babylon. Some of us were crying uh, 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 over our jobs. Yes, we did work on Sabbath, but... 
But man, I was, at least I was getting promoted. Uh, I was leading a group. I was leading a team. Uh, I was advancing. And, and some of us are crying uh, over Babylon. We, we talk about the good old days. We, we talk about how influential we were. We talk about uh, how many uh, uh, people we have been with. Uh, we talk about how good it was. And we are crying over Babylon because of the sugar of how sweet it was. You also have merchants in the passage who are crying over Babylon. They, they, they're, they're crying. No, no, notice what they, they say. Alas, alas. For the great city that was clothed in fine linen and in purple and, and scarlet and adorned with gold, with jewels and with pearls. Now these are crying over the finer things of life because Babylon gave them a good life. Babylon took care of them. Babylon blessed them. And, and now Babylon is no longer. Babylon has fallen. They're crying because it wasn't like that. They're crying because it's not like that right now. And let's be real, some of us are in this place where we are crying over Babylon. We talk about, we, we, we are at that place where we keep talking about, you know what? When it was back in the day, you don't know how good I had it. Right now, it's so hard for me. It's so difficult for me. It's not the same anymore. And I do not know if God loves me anymore. Some of us are at that place. Crying over Babylon, forgetting that when we're inside, it was difficult. And you know the problem with human beings is that we often forget the struggle when we're out of the struggle. All what we do is focus on the good things. We focus on the benefits, but we forget that there are so many dangerous things. We forget there were so many painful things. We forget there were so many challenging things. And that's why it was necessary for us to come out over that. And so if you are going to appreciate and enjoy victory that has been announced for you, you will need to recognize that Babylon has fallen. You will need to understand that you need to come out if you're going to initiate victory and you will need not to cry over Babylon. You will need to be forward ever and backward never. You need to be forward ever and backward never. And somebody today needs to be forward ever and backward never. You see, what I need to let you know is that it was, it was Gordon Granger who marched into Texas on June 19th, 1865. And when Gordon Granger came into Texas, he realized that the people of Texas, the blacks in Texas, uh, do not know about the Emancipation Proclamation. They do not know that victory has been issued for them. So he read the victory issue. He read to them their emancipation. This is what he read to them. He says, the people of Texas are informed that in accordance with the proclamation from the executive of the United States, all slaves are free. This involves an absolute equality of personal rights and rights of property between former masters and slaves. The connection heretofore existing between them becomes that between employer and hired labor. The freedmen are advised to remain quietly at their present homes and work for their wages. They are informed that they will not be allowed to collect at military posts and that they will not be supported in idleness either there or elsewhere. Brother and sister, be informed that in accordance with the proclamation of the mighty angel, Babylon has fallen. You have absolute right to enjoy the benefits of victory, you no longer are a slave to sin, a slave to confusion. Please be informed that you can't stay in Babylon, you must get out. Babylon will only keep you in confusion, but you need to start working and appreciating the victory that God has given over your life and start to build your life as it needs to be. Today, somebody needs to come out of Babylon. Babylon has fallen and today is time to come out. Is there an idea that is Babylonian that you need to leave? Is there a habit that is Babylonian that you need to leave? Is there a belief that is Babylonian that you need to leave? Today it is time to leave it so that you can start being faithful again to God. Because when you're faithful to God, that is when you appreciate and embrace the victory that he has for you. Today somebody 
Coming out of Babylon means accepting Jesus as Lord of your life and embracing everything that the Bible has to say. You will need to leave some wrong ideas about the Bible. Some of you need to accept the Sabbath as the day of worship. Some of you need to accept that those who die go in their grave. Some of you need to accept the right ideas about love. And so in commitment to that call, you are saying, I want to be more committed to Jesus. I want to be more committed to him. And today I want to give my life in baptism for Jesus because I want him. I'm committed to him and I want to be faithful to him. And I want you to know that by faith, you and I can make that commitment possible in February 2022, because that is when we're going to hold another baptism. And right now we can begin preparing you to ready you for your commitment coming out of Babylon party in February 2022. Today you can make that decision and we'd be more than happy to let you know. But somebody today needs to be like Gordon Granger, needs to be out there declaring that the proclamation has been issued. There are some of us here who have never shared our faith about Jesus. There are some of us here who have never given a Bible study. Some of us here who don't even talk about God. Today, that needs to change. We need to start going around and announcing to people that there is victory, announcing to people that Jesus is coming soon, announcing to people that today is a day of victory so that people can be freed from addictions. People can be freed from their struggles. People can be freed from, from depression. We are those people that are to declare and proclaim. Today, I came to let you know Babylon has fallen and let's come out of Babylon. Let's people, let, let, let's allow people to know this truth so that they can live from victory. Every head is bowed, every set of eyes is closed as we pray. Uh, Father God, thank you that Babylon has fallen and we believe it and we trust it. Please teach us your will, teach us your purpose. We humbly ask all of this in the awesome in wonderful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Did that word speak to you at a visceral level and you want to respond? Well, today you can do that. The number is on the screen at our JCC hotline number. Reach out to us and we'd be more than happy to help you to start a journey with God. And if the Lord has impressed your mind to contribute and to give, please do that as well on the number on the screen. And I want you to know that whatever you give, will help us to continue to talk about the love of Jesus and to help somebody get closer to him. May God bless you and look over you. I'm going to see you real soon. Take care.